Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, this time round, we're looking at a, a car that we've been restoring for some time. Uh, it's turned out to be virtually a full restoration because as ever, once you start scratching the surface with these things, uh, they tend to develop a life of their own as to what needs doing and what doesn't. Same as renovating a house or anything else you care to mention. But the car in question is this. It's the fifth ever production Lamborghini. It's chassis number 109. The first four cars, just to recap, were sold by Ferruccio and Lamborghini to very sympathetic and understanding friends who were prepared to be his sort of guinea pigs, for want of a better way of putting it, and just snag as to things they like and don't like and things of that sort of situation. But this car, they started officially making them at 105. This is 109. So this is uh, a very, very important piece of Lamborghini history, the fifth production car ever. Um, 350 GT, three and a half litre Bizzarini designed V12. A lot of them were changed. The 350 engine, like everything else that was cutting edge and new, really, in, in whatever sphere, the 350 GT engine they found could have some improvements. So they incorporated those into enlarging the engine to four litre. And um, what happened was when a lot of these 350 GTs went back to the factory, they got uprated to a four litre engine, um, as this one did actually. And the alloy bodywork and lightweight and a four litre V12 made them really go fast. These are fast cars, obviously not supercars by today's standards, but in the 1960s, early 60s, pretty hard to beat actually, uh, as a road car anyway. So here it is. Um, We've done lots of restoration on the car. Tony, um, who is very gifted at aluminium, and Martin, his brother, have done a marvellous job of making parts for this car. So I'm just going to go through some of those now and explain what, what's been going on. Well, the construction of this car incorporated a patented body system called Superleggera, Super Light. And the, the point of this was uh, a very, very sturdy chassis, very simply engineered, made out of box section steel. And then the outer skin of the body was hand rolled thin aluminium, which was literally laid on top of the frame. There's a frame in between the chassis and this called a tertiary frame or tertiary panelling, such as this here, which is steel and the whole lot sort of hung together. And it was a really efficient and lightweight way of making cars. You had the strength of the chassis and, and the, the svelte sort of very thin aluminium body. And lots of competition Ferraris were built in this way uh, in period as well. So what we've been doing on this, what Tony's been doing, all this area here was uh, really, really quite rusty. The outer aluminium, what happens is the mud and the dirt, it's not like modern cars where you have a plastic wheel arch liner which keeps 99% of the, the mud and the rain and the road salt or whatever else a car has got to contend with. I can't imagine this one's ever have, gonna have to contend with road salt, but it collects. It collects in crevices and nooks and crannies uh, that plastic wheel arch liners these days just don't allow to happen. So it just rots from the inside out, all this. So Tony's actually replaced the entire sill section, the inner section of steel, and handmade these beautiful aluminium formed sills. This is the jacking point here. Um, and then we've done some, uh, some stripping of the whole thing out so that the uh, engine, gearbox, everything is out. We weren't intending to do that originally but the car is going to be worth it when it's finished in terms of financially, but also it's going to do the car justice as well. It's, um, it's such an important car. It deserves to have a proper restoration job. Things like this, uh, there's been a new piece of aluminium let in there, same on both sides, because the steel underneath, there was electrolytic corrosion. And with modern treatments and things, we can stop that happening between metal and aluminium. But at the time, they didn't really build cars to last. I mean, in 1964, when this car was built, um, 1960, yeah, 1964, they weren't thinking about rust proofing and the fact that we'd be here in 2021 talking about the same car, completely off their radar. So they built the cars to be things of beauty, but not to be things that last. They didn't have the technology to make them last for decades and decades and decades. So. All the vulnerable areas, again, um, 
this wheel arch area here, all this from here down is all new metal and aluminium, as you can see on the uh, accompanying pictures. And the car is now ready, it's fully reconstructed, and it's going back to have its paintwork uh, very soon. And it's going back to the original colour that it had, it was maroon metallic, uh, has been for some years, which is uh, quite a pleasant colour actually, and it's, I think it suits the lines of the car as well. But it's going back to this colour here, very, very, very slightly evidence of it, which is very useful. We've managed to mix the paint according to code from 1964, but we've also got this as a backup, just to check as a reference, a datum. And it's actually a Fiat colour, Fiat metallic blue. So who says Italian cars don't cross-pollinate? Uh, so there we are. I'll just take you around a couple of other areas of the body that uh, have been lovingly rebuilt and recreated. As I mentioned earlier, that the floor is made of steel, the actual substructure is made of steel. And one of the horror stories that we did find was that the seatbelt mountings, because this car wouldn't have had seatbelts when it was new, the seatbelt mountings were actually just a piece of sheet steel welded onto the floor with the bare minimum of welding and strength. This is potentially fatal, really quite dangerous and something we really needed to address for safety reasons, obviously. And that's why Tony again made up a whole new section of floor, which is up to the job, super strong and much more elegant and tidy than the previous effort. Well, one of the perils of Italian coach building is that some fairly crude sort of techniques were used in the 1950s and 60s alongside beautiful artisan craftsmanship to make these cars. And this is a lump of sealant that was used to seal between the front inner wing and the front outer wheel arch uh, between the metal and aluminium. And as you can see, I think this lump weighed about three kilos, something like that. So um, the car is actually probably going to be lighter when it's finished being restored with modern sealants than it was when it was new. Interesting. Well, as I was talking about earlier, water traps, dirt being able to get in and not out. Here we have an absolutely classic example of this. You can quite clearly see the steel substructure underneath and then the aluminium skin laid on top of it. And Tony's actually sliced away part of the original aluminium skin, which was oxidized anyway. And you can see underneath that you can see daylight through the sheet metal and some of the framework. So Tony's actually removed all that and replaced it with new fabricated bits on both sides. And you can see here the slightly curved and then folded at the bottom sill sections which have been fabricated with the hole in for the jacking point. All this done from sheet alloy and yeah, very much as it would have been originally. The sills were then taken off and new sections such as the chassis jacking points that were built into the chassis were then remade. And you can see here that's been done. The long tube that runs along the whole of the sill, the underneath area, is actually a Italian coach building trick from that period, which Aston Martin also used on uh, the DB4, 5 and 6. It just adds strength. It adds torsional rigidity to this major structural part of the car. And of course, it's quite often missing on many cars that have rusted away in here quietly over the years. Quite scary, really. And here's the other side. Tony's made up new sections here, very much as he did on the other side. You can notice the bit of wire hanging down there from the wheel arch edge. That's how wheel arches were made on a lot of cars in this era. They were actually just wrapped round a piece of steel wire, again, just inviting corrosion and electrolytic corrosion between the dissimilar metals, the steel and the alloy that was wrapped around it. But hey, that was the 1960s. They weren't thinking about years ahead. So the rest of the wheel arch, the new aluminium section down the bottom will be similarly wrapped around that wire rod. Here's some of the original parts of the sills. Um, not too bad at all, I've seen far worse than this, but obviously they've just rotted away here along this seam, which is um, pop riveted uh, into, onto the metal frame and doesn't need much moisture behind there, particularly when it's right in the line of fire from the front or rear wheel. To, uh, to cause things to go wrong. You just get mud and water uh, spattered up there. This is a part of the rear quarter. Again, it's just, it's just corroded away as aluminium does, just disappeared, oxidized. 
Yeah, because great care has been taken not only with making these parts, but also with the preservation of them moving forward, everything has been very carefully coated in anti-corrosive paint. It was called red lead in the old days, but it's more lovey-dovey and more environmentally friendly than that these days, but nonetheless effective. So this car is actually going to be far better protected than it was when it was built in the 1960s to make sure that this car has a legacy spanning several decades to come. And the suspension, all the running gear we've taken off the car, we're going to refurbish as well. The car is going to be painted underneath and the engine compartment to make it all lovely. And then it's going away to be painted and then we bolt everything back on once it's refurbished. I have to say, this car is in remarkably good condition. Uh, in spite of some of the things I'm showing you, this is really minor stuff. I mean, I've, I've seen Aston Martins that we've restored over the years, very similar construction, as I say, in a terrible state. Sills just rusted away, strengthening tubes gone. This car is remarkably well preserved, all things considered. One of the questions that is often forgotten, but we're gonna ask the customer um, experience has showed us, we ask them, do they want a door mirror or not? Uh, if not, we fill in these holes now. We don't wait till the car's beautifully painted. We actually aluminium weld these so that uh, if, if you want a different type of door mirror with different centers for the holes or no mirror at all, because this car has got a lot of glass, it's very easy to look out of this car, then all the better, because these didn't have mirrors when they were new. So anybody who put one on, it was an aftermarket mirror. Well, one of the things that Ferruccio Lamborghini was very good at was employing the best talent available. And he bought off the drawing board a V12 engine from Giotto Bizzarini. He'd been instrumental in developing the Ferrari 250 GTO. Not a bad thing to have on your CV, really, considering it's the most valuable and coveted classic car in the world as a model. So Bizzarini penned a 4-cam V12 initially for racing, and it was detuned to provide road power and be more tractable and not as high revving at the time. And that engine was so right that uh, they carried on developing it, they stretched it, they redesigned it. Admittedly, the block was completely redesigned during the 1980s twice, and a lot of things changed, but conceptually that engine, that Bizzarini V12, stayed right up until the end of that engine's production in the Murcielago in 2010. So huge span of time. The engine developed almost twice as much power as it did uh, from its original output. Um, and the capacity was increased enormously as well. But conceptually, the engine was the same. Um, and we'll just have a look at that very quickly. Yeah, this is one of the Lamborghini V12 engines we've got here at the moment. Um, and very, very similar. This is the 4-litre V12. Uh, the block is, it's a 60-degree engine, perfect angle for V12s. Um, either that or 180 degrees are the two magic numbers to do with uh, firing order and um, uh, pulses into the crankshaft, uh, etc. But this block is made of silicon alloy, LM8, which is then heat-treated to increase hardness and rigidity. And uh, yeah, Basically, same engine, um, the five litre, they redesigned the block because the, uh, the, block, well, the four litre block wouldn't stretch reliably to that. Uh, but, um, and obviously the engine was continually developed with uh, fuel injection and more capacity increases, four valve cylinder heads with the Quattrovolvo Countach in 1985, then developed again for the Diablo. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, a really, really great piece of uh, engineering right from the word go. Well, by pure coincidence, we happen to have the other end of the spectrum in the workshop at the moment, the Murcielago. This is the last model that was supposedly built with the original Lamborghini V12 engine, although it was developed as all these engines are, same with the Bentley V8. It was very similar to the original engine going back to 1959, 1960, but once you brought in cross-bolted main bearings in 1989 on that Bentley V8 engine, that Rolls-Royce V8 engine, it began to lose its similarity, but it was still very traceable. Same with this. The engine in this Musielago traces its roots right back to the 350 GT. And this was the last model to use that engine. The engine that was developed for the Aventador in 2011 was a wholly new engine. 
So this is an original Series 1 Murcielago. It could be called an LP580, but it isn't. The later car immediately after this was the LP640, but this develops 580 brake horsepower, so it's not too slow. It's essentially a restyle of the Diablo. Some purists would throw their arms up in horror at saying that, but the underpinnings are Diablo VT 6 litre. This engine is 6.2 litres, but uh, it's four wheel drive. The big difference with this was, the car was designed by Luke Dol Donkervolk, who is uh, a very, very talented designer, not Italian. Um, and nothing to do with uh, Marcello Gandini as such, but of course, lots of styling cues. The scissor doors, for example. But this was the first car that was primarily Audi driven in its development. Audi had owned Lamborghini for a few years. They'd got to know each other. And this is primarily an, an Audi overseen effort, which means it just works better as a car, dare I say it. The, the combination of G German overseeing of Italian flair is, is really quite a special combination, as it has been in Britain with Rolls-Royce and Bentley and the resurrection of those marks. But the panel fit, all the mouldings, everything are really lovely high quality, as is the paintwork, even though um, it wasn't done at the Lamborghini factory, it was subcontracted to a company called Imperiale, and they do most of the paintwork for the Lamborghini factory. But the, the quality of the car is absolutely outstanding. Much better build quality than the earlier cars. This car also has the manual gearbox. It doesn't have the e-gear transmission, as it's called. The first e-gear cars were very unreliable in terms of clutch wear. Uh, when you were pulling away, the software in the ECU, the electronic control unit that controlled the clutch, the e-gear system, would allow the clutch to slip a massive amount. Normally, if you're used to driving cars like this, you use the clutch almost as a switch, uh, and you don't, you don't allow it to slip too much. But the eGay software kept the clutch slipping until you'd pulled away. Result, the, the clutch either overheated and went to nothing in the space of a few seconds or a few minutes if you were maneuvering the car and didn't know what you were doing, or at best, it would only last a few thousand miles, a few thousand kilometers in wear. Ferrari had the same issue with the 355 and the 360. Uh, they, their software also wore clutches out very quickly if you're in the slightest bit maneuvering because they just slipped the clutch too much. Things have moved on. The later e-gear cars on the LP640, much better to use. But the manual gearbox in this car is an absolute delight. I personally would much rather have a manual car like this, much rather. Well, just looking at this wonderful legendary engine in almost its final iteration, uh, it's, it's not recognizable as the original 3.5 litre engine. There's been so much trickery and so much magic around the induction system as much as anywhere else. Uh, you basically got four throttle bodies here uh, coming into the engine, each one serving three cylinders. And what you've got here is a clever little gizmo, which is controlled by a vacuum solenoid, which shuts off a valve, a butterfly valve, inside here at low revs. So what you actually have there, instead of two throttles at high RPM, just letting um, as much air as these six cylinders want in, what it actually does is splits them up into two three-cylinder sections because three-cylinder engines, because of the acoustics and the thermodynamics, actually have more torque low down uh, than a six-cylinder engine does. And this has been sort of written into engine know-how for years. But what Lamborghini have cleverly done is separated this. So at low revs, this is not a V12. It's four three-cylinder engines connected together. And that really does improve the low down torque and drivability. V12s are not, not as torquey generally as the likes of a V8 because of the, the way the firing pulses are fed into the crankshaft. Like a V-twin, Ducati can put its power down more than a, at low revs and in tight corners more than a Japanese four-cylinder. It's just the physics that are involved with cylinder pulses. But um, yeah, this is uh, just a little clever, a clever trick that uh, Lamborghini, along with a lot of other manufacturers, used in the early part of the 21st century. So we're gonna take this car on the road now give it a run and uh, see how it all performs. 
Well, the first thing to notice before we do go out on the road is that this car has got a lot more space inside than uh, a Diablo and even more than a Countach. The Countach is actually quite claustrophobic, dare I say it. Wonderful car though it is. And I think that's probably why the Countach polarizes people so much because it's so um, almost intimidating even before you set off, before you start the engine. This car is quite a lot more user-friendly inside. I've got plenty of room for my feet and legs, more elbow room and some headroom. What Luke Donkervolk has managed to do is increase the size of the car slightly, but not obviously, but it really pays off in terms of where it's needed in the cabin. I'm six foot tall. I can sit in this car with plenty of space. So that bodes well. The gear change is absolutely beautiful. Considering the amount of power that's being transmitted through this gearbox, the gear change is absolutely sweet. It's like, uh, it's like a mini gear change. You're just not aware of the fact that you're shifting big cogs with big torque. So there we go. Let's take it on the road and see how she runs. Well, the first thing I notice about this car is it's very, the engine is incredibly quiet. Uh, it really is. I mean, it, you, I'm just whispering along now and so is the engine. It's just uh, very well insulated from the passenger compartment. A lot of road noise quite a, a firm ride to put it mildly uh, the clutch is really light the gear change as I've already mentioned is is uh, dead smooth and really um, light to use um, and the clutch is it's it's quite potentially quite misleading because the clutch is I'm just using the clutch as a switch there that's all I'm doing I'm not slipping it anything like that um, you've got to be so careful because the engine's so isolated you can easily slip the clutch, clutch without knowing it even in a manual car um, no wonder in the uh, in the first of the uh, Geartronics as they were called uh, the E-Gears sorry they, um, they actually had a problem because uh, it's very very refined really uh, Steering is nicely weighted. I've always found the Ferrari 355 a bit light on the power steering, um, but this is good. Uh, yeah, the ride's smoothing out now, everything's warming up a bit. All the T's and P's are up to speed, the temperatures and pressures. Uh, to a certain extent, the car's driving itself. It's very, very easy to drive. A very wide car, so you're aware of the width of it. But um, yeah, it's uh, a very nice place to be. The engine's very tractable. Uh, but it don't half shake you about. Combination of British roads and Lamborghini suspension is, uh, whoa, bumpy. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Well, enough of assessing its low speed capabilities. Let's give it some stick and see what it's like for what it's really built for. Well, one thing's clear, you run out of revs very quickly with that manual gearbox. Uh, with the E-gear, I'm sure it, uh, it actually works through the gears with you, as they do with all these um, automatic manual converted gearboxes. But uh, I'm just amazed again, there's no induction roar from the engine. You're not really aware that, um, that you're you know, pushing the engine really hard. This car's got the standard exhaust system on, which is actually not such a bad thing. That There are a lot of aftermarket exhausts available for most Yellagos. But um, the problem is that people actually remove heat shielding from the standard factory exhaust system, which is very, very crucial to be there because uh, this thing does generate a lot of heat from the exhaust system when it's, uh, when it's fully warmed up and when it's been on a, a blast. And uh, there have been several Mercy Elegos that have actually gone on fire because of uh, lack of heat shielding on the exhaust. No such worries with this. We'll just take it through the uh, take it up through the paces again.
great. Nothing like as dramatic as a Countach, uh, nothing like as uh, visceral as an experience, but this is a 209 mile an hour car, a 200, 333 kilometers. Uh, there's plenty going on. Uh, it's hardly slow, to say the least. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll just try that acceleration again. That's interesting, even with the uh, with the four-wheel drive, the traction control light is still flashing when I uh, accelerate full bore in it. Amazing. And the brakes on this car are the, uh, the normal conventional cast iron discs. The later cars had the carbon ceramic discs. But the problem is, when this car was being developed in the late 90s uh, for launch in 2001, um, carbon ceramic uh, brake technology, surface transform technology under braking was still very much in its infancy. And there was a lot of research and development going on. I mean, carbon brakes have been used on aircraft for years. Um, I, they've been around a very long time, but in a restricted and controlled environment, um, the only restricted and controlled environment you have when buying one of these babies is uh, enough money and something resembling a driver's license. Um, so, a uh, whole different ball game. I have to say, I'm loving this car. It just does everything so effortlessly. If you look after it, it'll look after you. What a fantastic piece of machinery. Well, there we have it. The first iteration and almost the last generation of the Bizzarini V12. It's the thing that actually was one of Lamborghini's unique selling points for many years, the, the, the halo effect of a V12 that even out, outgunned Ferrari for some years. So um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back soon. Please like, please share, please subscribe. Bye for now.